sex, six packs, and six figures. Now, I've done a lot of uh, uh, previous content kind of bashing uh, the red pill. And while I'm still not a fan, I do want to come out and say that I don't want to outright condemn uh, everything that they espouse because what I truly believe, and many of the guys that, you know, that are my closest friends, uh, faithful Catholics, good men, we'll all agree that they get from a diagnostic perspective, uh, from an observational perspective, they get a lot of things correct. It's just the remedies, the solutions um, that become degenerate, that are degenerate. And the reason that, you know, I speak so harshly on this is because I was enveloped, you know, in that lifestyle for many years as a, as a guy in my 20s. And so what this video is about is what's commonly touted as like sort of the three points um, or three pathways in which a man gains some kind of, you know, fulfillment or, you know, enjoyment or enlightenment, if you will, for lack of a better term, in his life. Sex, six pack, and six figures. So racking up your notch count, um, you know, getting in really good shape and uh, pursuing financial success. Now, these things are not bad. Now, sex has got to be obviously well-ordered in a, you know, devoted marriage. Being in shape, certainly a good thing. Uh, making money, certainly a good thing. The problem is when men make these their God and that when they're degenerate fornicators. So let's start with the, the, the first point with the virtuous um, flip side and observation from my end. Because again, I lived this life in my 20s. I was a guy that was over 300 pounds, lost a bunch of weight, got really good shape, lifted a lot of weight, you know, started a gym, became successful you know, at, an early, at an early age and took advantage of this. Uh, you know, I, I drank from the whole well of, uh, of, the, of the red pill and thought this was a, a thing that men are supposed to do. We're supposed to just kind of get this out of our system uh, in our 20s, in our youth, when I didn't realize that it's something that you uh, get into your system, not out of your system. And it can really corrupt uh, your soul and your character. And so, but the first thing, it's, it's, it's sex. And I, fir I firmly believe that within every man is the desire um, for one devoted, faithful woman. The more I pursued, you know, this lifestyle of promiscuity, the more I found myself at the other side of these, you know, casual encounters, broken, hollow, confused as to, you know, why this, you know, this type of thing was, was promoted but I was feeling continually worse and worse and worse, not only just for myself, but for, you know, uh, the women I'd be you know, doing these things with. That either I was hurting myself, I was hurting them, or as a combination of both. And I mean that from like, you know, an emotional heartbreak type of sense. It never really quite felt good or gratifying. Um, you know, some guys are say, it would, would say, hey, it's easy for you to say you experienced it. But I think it's really important to for us to understand the vicarious or to learn vicariously through other men that are saying, hey, listen, like there's nothing for you here. And I found myself at the end of a lot of these, again, these encounters saying, I just want one woman. I don't know what this is all about. I, don't, I think I was sold a false bill of goods, but I was kind of shoving that beneath the surface because I thought, um, oh, that's what simps do. That's what nice guys do. This is, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing as a man. And then when I finally met my wife, suddenly I felt like I was no longer worthy of a, a good woman's love because the more I treated others like cheap sexual objects, the more I you know, indirectly treated myself like a cheap sexual object. And then now as a devoted family man and a, and a faithful husband, I realized that all the things that I was seeking, I found in a devoted, faithful marriage. So what do I mean by that? So uh, sexual promiscuity is promoted, but the flip side is, is chastity and being faithful to one woman. Guys, I can't say this enough that the right woman is a force multiplier, the greatest force multiplier a man could have in his life. And it could be an equally destructive force too if he doesn't you know, vet her properly. I mean, that's a story for a different day, but it could be the greatest force multiplier. My wife certainly was. You know, I would not have been uh, or not have become the man that I am today without her influence. And so... And from a, you know, a multitude of different angles, um, this is exactly how God uh, designed it. And it's so much better than anything you could experience um, living that promiscuous lifestyle. I think most guys that are living this lifestyle are, are lying to themselves. They're just enslaved to their flesh. But really deep down, they want 
one woman to grow with, one woman to love, and one woman to create a family with. And so from a sexual satisfaction standpoint, you can look everywhere online. There are many studies that show the, the, the men that express the highest degrees of sexual satisfaction are married men. So if it's about sex and, sex and pleasure, then why don't more men get married? Now, there's a, certainly an argument for you know legal marriage not being a good idea for modern men. And I certainly have thoughts on that and you know how covenantal, sacramental marriage is, is far more important. Um, but the point still stands. Having the experience that I have and looking back with what I have now, from a physical pleasure standpoint, mental, spiritual, emotional, what I experience now in intimacy with my wife is a million times greater than anything I experienced before with those casual encounters. Again, another thing that a lot of men uh, want to ignore. And they'll, they'll throw all kinds of copes uh, about it. But that's the reality, is that when you reduce a someone to a something and you use them mainly, uh, mainly as a means of a masturbatory device, um, you're doing that to yourself as well. You're cheapening the sexual act that's meant for uh, uh, procreation, that's meant uh, for marriage. And uh, a lot of men are going to end up on the other side of 40, 50, 60, regretting this experience that they had. So the flip side of sexual experience of that sex, six pack and six figures uh, equation is uh, chastity. And so now the second thing is six pack. So again, this is not a bad thing. I want to quote uh, Pope Pius XII. So physical strength is God's gift to uh, women and children in society, and that it's an effective antidote to effeminacy. These are all great things, but what's really interesting is that if this is not well ordered, if you're just want a six pack for the sake of having a six pack, and you know, you know, you're obsessively looking in the mirror, you're taking these you know vain photos or you know, you're lifting weights and trying to attain a level of strength and where your meaning and your purpose, you're putting this thing on the pedestal, on a pedestal, it makes you effeminate. I know a lot of very jacked guys, very lean guys that are, have a high degree of physical fortitude that are very effeminate guys because they're highly, highly, highly obsessed with their diets. They're highly, highly, highly obsessed with their physiques. And I was once this guy as well. So what something that could be so useful in cultivating masculinity where, and especially as a, as a man who's faithful, grace builds on nature. And it could be a really powerful tool of redemptive suffering. But the line between redemptive suffering and vain suffering is so thin. It's so, it's, it's a very shallow line where it could easily become uh, vain suffering for the sake of it. Um, and so when it's well-ordered, when you train to the glory of God, when you train to sort of reconnect with your origin of, of painful toil, what I mean by that is, is what was Adam's punishment after the fall? It was toil. It was labor. And I'm going to quote my good friend, Will Nolan, because he's got so many bangers. Um, it reconnects a man with the desire to grip the broadsword and go into battle. Now, that sounds really dramatic, right? But there's something very primal and very satisfying about lifting weights and struggling through a set and, and, and you know, locking it out and, and, and completing it and, and attaining it higher and higher and higher level strength. But strength just for strength's sake or leanness just for leanness sake is an effeminate pursuit. And so Pope Pius XII said that if it's not well-ordered, and I'm paraphrasing here, that uh, you and your physical strength are equally banished to hell. It cannot be put on the pedestal. So yes, train for the greater glory of God. Train to uh, reconnect yourself with the painful toil of being a man. It can be a powerful tool of redemptive suffering and sanctification. But I found myself after I lost 120 pounds and deadlifted over 800 pounds, there was always an extra pound or two or percentage or, or two points of leanness that I wanted to achieve. And even when I got to those points, an elite level of physical strength, especially as a natural trainee, never quite felt like enough. Has to be well ordered. And now, not to say that some at some points during my training sessions when they don't go as well, there's not that tinge of the flesh for a second. But what well or, what orders it back is that I'm training for the greater glory of God. That I'm just grateful to show up and to train to be able to train my body in such a way that is it, it can be such a powerful tool against effeminacy and a powerful tool of sanctification. And again, that idea of redemptive suffering really orders it well because I'm not putting second things first and first things second. The first thing, all things done for the glory of God. And then the second thing is the pleasure of the pursuit. But the pleasure of the pursuit is fleeting. And if you're looking for a certain weight at the other end of the barbell that's going to fulfill you or your six pack being just a little bit more crisp or your shoulders being a little bit more round or what have you, uh, that can absolutely 
make you effeminate. It's downright unattractive to women, to women as well. Um, you know, in my experience with my wife, there's been times I've been very lean and times that I've been bigger. And, you know, she prefers me when I'm bigger. So these guys that are obsessing over their six packs are really doing it for other men. So we have to just kind of, you know, uh, call it, call it like it is. So now the third thing is the six figures um, piece of this as well. And I'm going to go out and say this straight up is that a man that makes $40,000 a year, but prioritizes guiding the souls of his family to heaven is a greater provider and a greater man than a billionaire that puts work over faith and family. You have to understand that, you know, past a certain level of need, you know, keeping the lights on, of course, keeping the heat on, putting food on the table. We don't need all this access. And that's coming from an ambitious guy. And I recently had a conversation uh, on CMask, the CMask podcast, which you guys should absolutely subscribe to if you haven't. Um, is that most ambition is of the devil. You kind of all, you're on this hamster wheel in, in perpetuity, chasing that next dollar, chasing that next dollar. And I was kind of confronted with this too. Um, you know, I sold, we sold our smaller home a number of years ago to move here and we built this beautiful house. And I was very proud of that as a father. I was like, yeah, you know, I built my family house. That's cool, which is great. You know, glory to Jesus for that and for giving me the resources to, to be able to do that. But recently I went back home and we were staying in a basement suite for the week that I was uh, visiting family. Uh, in Vancouver. And what I noticed was my daughters, you know, didn't really care about the surroundings. Obviously they wanted to be home, but they were happy. They were joyful. You know, they were having fun because we were around them. All our children need is two parents that love them and that are present. And so I kind of quickly realized that, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have nicer things for your family, but past a certain point, we have to realize that as men, it's for us, it's for our ego. Recently, my wife and I have been driving through, you know, the nicest neighborhood in the city. And we're like, oh yeah, you know, God willing, within X amount of time, we're going to be living here. And I came back home and I said, you know, Lord Jesus, please, you know, don't give me an appetite beyond my means that I'm kind of chasing this invisible uh, uh, carrot on the string on this, you know, treadmill, this, this hamster wheel. Oh, I'm doing it for my family. But then I, I realized having reflecting back on this experience where they were just, you know, this small little basement suite, they had toys, but they had their, their, their parents around. They don't care about this stuff. They don't need this stuff. This stuff is for us and to appease our own ego and past a certain point too, the tax man is just going to take more of it. So I came to this realization that if the flip side of creating more wealth impedes my ability to be present, with my family, um, it's not worth it. If it's to the, their detriment, and now that means dad is away more, but he's bringing in more money, I don't know how that serves them better than me being present and maybe making a little bit less. And that sounds like a cope. And I think that over time, you know, you know, Lord's providence, I don't know Lord, the Lord's will, but I think there is a balance to strike there. And sometimes this is the one out of these three that, I've struggled with the most because I was raised with kind of like a scarcity mindset around money. So it never really quite felt, quite felt like enough. But after my return to Catholicism and this peace that I have in my spirit, this joy that I have in my spirit, it is becoming more well-ordered. So this is me kind of lecturing myself as well that past a certain point, my children, my wife don't need more money. They need more of me. And especially as I, as I grow older, is that being the prophet and priest over my home, the spiritual leader, uh, the man that prioritizes bringing their souls to heaven above all things, especially above finances, uh, that's the a at the apex of importance. You see, so manhood perfects boyhood, but fatherhood protect, uh, perfects manhood. That is the priority. Again, just like training, just like sex, we're not putting second things first and first things second. The first thing is my duty and that realization when we were in that basement suite where my children don't really care where they're at, they just care that we're with them. And I'll repeat it again. The man that makes $40,000 a year but prioritizes guiding the souls of his family to heaven is a greater provider than a billionaire that leaves a trust for his family that puts uh, work over faith and family. So this is the inversion, or I guess the virtuous flip side of the sex, six pack, and six figures um, uh, thing that's promoted all over the internet to young men is don't get confused. These things aren't 
bad things, but when they're not well ordered, when sex is not within the container of a devoted marriage, when the six pack is pursued for the six pack's sake, or six figures are are pursued for the the sake of six figures, um, these things are not going to bring you fulfillment. I experienced success early on, early in my twenties, and I think it spoiled me a lot, and it never quite felt like enough. And now, where I'm at, you know, financially, and where I'm at in, in terms of being a family man, I'm, I'm I look back and I see this. It could have been any amount of money per month. There was always a dollar more to be accumulated. There's always a pound more in the bar that I could have gotten. There's always one more girl, one more notch on the belt, so to speak. And all of these things, the pursuit of these things brought me destruction because they were not in their proper place. And so I wish more red pill men could take the good and discard the bad. Because again, from a diagnostic perspective, they get things correct. It's the remedies, it's the solutions. It's the, the, the prescriptions that are degenerate. And so hopefully this is a value to a lot of men out there that it kind of shakes them awake. Learn from my story. You don't have to make the same mistakes. Yeah. Glory to Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching.